Good afternoon and, and welcome everyone to today's presentation, Climate Risk Disclosure. What does it mean for Saskatchewan business? Uh, as we'll see from today's discussion, climate change has arrived and it's already having a material financial impact. And this reality is reflected in the responsibilities of corporate directors and anyone who has a fiduciary responsibility to govern or steward an organization. My name's Alistair McFadden, and in addition to being an executive in residence with the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy, I'm your moderator for today's event. Uh, Johnson Shoyama, or JSGS, is a national hub for advanced study and research in public policy administration and implementation. Uh, we're a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, that was based on the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that defines Saskatchewan. Since our inception in 2007, we've swiftly become one of Canada's leading policy schools for educating graduate students and public servants interested in and devoted to advancing public value. We're pleased to be hosting today's lecture with a couple of partnering organizations. The first is the Canada Climate Law Initiative, or CCLI. They examine the role of corporate directors, pension trustees, and other fiduciaries to consider, manage, and report on climate-related financial risk and opportunities. CCLI delivers foundational legal research and tools that can help guide Canadian directors and trustees to deliver on their obligations. With support from its funders, CCLI is able to offer free confidential presentations to boards across Canada on the importance of climate change and how to get started on providing effective oversight on climate related risks and opportunities. Housed at UBC Centre for Business Law, CCLI, and their pro bono presentations to directors and trustees help Canadians understand their duties and the fiduciary obligations related to climate change. Our second partner is the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce. As the voice of Saskatchewan business, the Saskatchewan Chamber is uniquely equipped to develop policies and accurately uh, reflect the needs of the business community. In addition to their policy and advocacy work, they facilitate a range of events, programs, and benefits to strengthen and grow Saskatchewan's network of chambers and member businesses and our economy. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge that while today's event is taking place online, JSGS and our physical home is located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories and the traditional home of the Métis. CCLI is located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam peoples. We're glad to welcome those of you who are joining us today from across Turtle Island. To help our event run smoothly, we ask that all attendees stay muted and turn off your video during the presentation portion of our event. The format for today's event is as follows. Uh, our three speakers will each present for about 10 minutes each. Following all three presentations, our speakers will entertain questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, please use Zoom's chat function to send your questions to me, Alistair McFadden, and I'll read out your question. Feel free to submit those questions at any time during today's event. If you have any logistical questions during the event, please don't hesitate to send a message to Karen Jaster LaForge or to Sonia Lee Troche via the chat function. You can also email Karen at jsgs.events at uregina.ca if you're having Zoom issues. Now, please note that as with all of our public lectures, this presentation is being recorded and it's going to be available for viewing on the JSGS website at a later date. Now, with the formalities out of the way, I'm pleased to introduce you to today's speakers in the order that they are presenting. First is Dr. Margot Hurlbert. Uh, Dr. Hurlbert's research is, uh, her focus is on governance and climate change, energy and water, interrogating laws, policies and practices uh, that will address both the problem of climate change and adaptation and mitigation to the, to the changing climate. She's participated in and, and led research projects focusing on aspects of governance, including energy, water, agriculture, uh, producer livelihoods, drought and flood. Dr. Hurlbert has been coordinating lead author, contributing author and review editor uh, 
for the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. Her passion is determining participatory governance mechanisms and constructing action-based imaginaries that help us achieve our Paris goals, net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The geographical focus of her research is Western Canada and South America. Second is Lisa DeMarco. Lisa is a senior partner and CEO at Resilient LLP and is recognized as a Canadian and international expert in climate and energy law. She has over 25 years of experience in law, regulation, policy, and advocacy related to all aspects of climate change and clean energy. Lisa also assists leading uh, financial and energy companies and indigenous business organizations on domestic and overseas renewable power project development, energy storage projects, sustainable and climate financial transactions, carbon capture and storage, climate related financial disclosure, corporate climate risk, environmental and social governance, green bonds, and sustainable business strategy. Lisa plays an active role for Fortune 500 companies in corporate environmental and social governance, climate change and transitional strategy, target setting and compliance. Lisa also represents several governments and leading energy companies in a wide variety of natural gas, power, pipeline and energy storage matters before the Ontario Energy Board and the National Energy, Bo energy Board. Our third panelist is Chad Eggerman. He's a projects lawyer who practices in the areas of real estate, construction, in including procurement and contracts, environmental, financing and Aboriginal law. In addition to maintaining a general corporate and commercial practice, Chad advises clients on a variety of, in a variety of industries with a particular focus on energy, infrastructure and natural resource projects. We're looking forward to an interesting and engaging discussion and I'm pleased to turn the floor over to today's first speaker, Dr. Margot Hurlbert, followed by Lisa and Chad in our Q&A session. So over to you, Margot, to share your screen. Thank you, Alistair, and thank you for the kind introduction. I'm going to speak just briefly on climate change and the science that's coming from the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change and some of the work that the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change has done in relation to risk, but also some of the great work from the Canadian Climate Law Initiative around risk uh, as an introduction for Lisa's presentation. So the Land and Climate Report that came out in 2019 documented that we are experiencing climate change. It's real and humans are the cause of this. The change in surface air temperature over land is already at 1.9 degrees Celsius greater than it was pre-industrial age. So this is the iconic figure from the Land and Climate Report just recently that shows that climate change is here. In a run-up of the United Nations Framework Con Convention for Climate Change that's going to happen this uh, winter, the uh, Executive Secretary came up with 10 things that we should take note of that the science is showing us that are causes for concern. The first is emissions from permafrost melting are likely worse than we have expected. Climate change is going to severely exacerbate the water crisis and electrification is pivotal in addressing and mitigating for climate change. And then the last number 10, I know you can't read it, but it says going to court to defend human rights can be an essential climate action. So thinking about law and how it impacts the pivotal points and changes in the future is becoming top of mind in the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change and the sixth assessment report that'll be coming out over the next couple years. So the global risk landscape has changed so much in the last few years because of COVID, but still prominent in that global risk is the risk of extreme weather and the risk of climate action failure. So we know that we're having an uh, incredible challenge addressing COVID, but we also know that addressing climate change is going to be extremely important uh, into the future. 
We also know that the window of opportunity is still open, but it is closing. So our carbon budget in the atmosphere is dangerously uh, getting very near to a point where we don't think that we can achieve uh, the Paris Agreement commitment to try to keep global warming to less than two degrees Celsius because of the amount of greenhouse gases that is entering into our atmosphere. So this is one of those iconic signs that shows that the track that we are on with greenhouse gases, if we don't curb and abate them, we might reach uh, global warming levels of up to four degrees Celsius on that RCP number six, or worst case scenario with business as usual, perhaps around 5.4 degrees Celsius. So to keep global warming to less than two degrees, we have to reduce emissions an incredible amount. Uh, and in fact, when I go to the next slide, we need to think about negative emission technologies. So this is actually showing the nationally determined contributions. So the obligations of states that they make in the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change and how it is not quite going to meet the required level of change in order to achieve less than two degrees Celsius. But what's different with this window of opportunity, this policy stream that's developing, is that countries are coming out ahead of the Glasgow meeting for the UNFCC with incredible commitments. So in the last month, we saw the United States commit to reduce 55% of their uh, 2005 emissions by 2030. Canada came out with 45%. And this pales in comparison to the United Kingdom, who's going to reduce their 1990 emissions by 78% by 2035. So we're seeing a very different groundswell in climate commitment. So in the financial world, some of you have may seen the black swan events where in the Northern hemisphere we'd never seen a black swan. So we never thought it existed. What we have in front of us is what some are referring to as a gray rhino. We know it's there, we know it's a risk, but many people, many governments, many organizations really haven't thought through all of the potential risk and harm. So I'm not gonna cover all of these, but there's an incredible risk on investments. Pension plans are becoming very, very invested with what they are investing on. Regulation is changing, which we'll speak to a little bit about here. Lisa, Chad will talk to disclosure and legal duty. So the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change between the special reports and the AR6 came out with a risk guidance where it was putting together all of the basic types of risks and noting that different scientists and different businesses and governments and people regard risk very, very differently. So as scientists, our job is actually more in relation to uncertainty and trying to understand and establish certainty. So scientists tend to be very comfortable with uncertainty, but there is a lot that scientists know. And the physical risks around climate change in AR6, Chapter 11 of Working Group 1, will come out with very specific attribution to the human causes of climate change. We know that the, the droughts are going to get worse and more severe. We know we're going to have more forest fires. We know we're going to have flooding events. And just this morning, I was looking at a list of the IPC putting together all of the cities like San Francisco, Vancouver, New Orleans, and rising sea levels and the risks of inundation and damage to infrastructure. We know that real estate investments are going to be subject to risk. Employees are going to be ill from heat waves and pollution, and different regions are going to be impacted in different ways. So this risk, we know it's happening. The scientists have been pointing it out for years. And I'm showing you on the left-hand side what the IPCC and, and the scientists use in order to determine uh, the IPCC reports. So when you, when you hear the phrase that humans are very 
virtually certain the cause of climate change. If you hear that phrase from the IPCC, it means it's 99 to 100% probability based on climate scenarios, climate modeling, social, physical, natural scientists. Very likely is 90 to 100, likely is 66 to 100. And I just want to point this out in relation to uh, the test of tort liability in law, which is on the balance of probabilities. Now, not to make it too simple, because there's many features of causation that we have to think about. But if we're saying on the balance of probability, someone caused harm, we're saying it's greater than 50% likelihood. So when we're talking about certainty of human attribution to climate change, and these types of likely, very likely phrases are heard, know that very likely is over 90% and virtually certain is 99 to 100. So transitional risks are risks that occur and maybe some haven't thought about these. This is the risks of what it's gonna look like to go to a low carbon economy. There's gonna be changes in consumer and investor pre preferences. Our young people are very engaged and very concerned about climate change and what's happening. Uh, and their consumer preferences may change. They're already starting to launch um, uh, intergenerational climate change lawsuits. Changes in government policies are coming, as I mentioned, with our contractual obligations, sorry, our regulatory obligations that will come down uh, to reduce to that 50% 5% in the United States and 45% in Canada. So with that, we know we have to start planning. So we know there's going to be stranded assets because if we're reducing carbon by 45% and we're trying to achieve net zero by 2050, we know that natural gas plants will no longer be able to run without CCS. We know that carbon intensive fuel exports uh, will be reduced. We know that we'll see price and demand from trade partners uh, changing. And what Lisa will talk a bit more about is liability risks for failure to disclose material climate risks to investors. So Canada is taking an incredible uh, stance on this. Some of the acts are on the right-hand side of this slide. I won't go through, but notice on the left-hand side that there are a couple countries already in that net zero emissions race, and many other countries are also proposing legislation. Norway, Sweden already have legislation and others are actually um, developing the policy and targeting discussions. So thank you for that. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be free to answer them uh, after the next presentation and then Chad's presentation. Thanks very much, Margot. Uh, apologies to all. We've had a few little internet connectivity issues today. So if it gets a little bit spotty, I will log off on the video. What I'd like to chat with you about is effective climate governance for corporate boards in general, looking at some of those risk factors and some of the basic science that Margot's spoken about and talking about what's next, what actions are being taken and what shall we do. Next slide. So let's look at climate in the context of COVID recovery. It's not a secret that we saw a very drastic reduction in emissions in some resulting from uh, the COVID crisis, very specifically travel and air travel related emissions are significantly down and a number of other transportation related emissions are also very significantly lower. In the context of recovery, most and many jurisdictions have really pushed a build back better, build back greener, build back more climate conscious recovery plan. And Canada was certainly no exception. Certainly Canada has pushed for uh, net carbon, uh, net zero carbon by 2050. And we have now currently 6.64 billion with a B committed to home retrofits, EV charging stations and associated nature-based climate solutions, predominantly in the form of tree planting. In the US, through the climate summit held on April 22nd, we've got additional commitments, very significant. The $2 trillion climate plan includes committing to a carbon-free energy sector by 2035, which is a very significant step for the US as compared to Canada that has significant natural resources in its energy sector that it can bring to bear. 
Uh, and then they've also established a working group to set up a, and determine a social cost of carbon to prepare for climate accountability. It's noteworthy that the state of New York came forward in December with a social cost of carbon of $125 a ton. Uh, that's last December. So things are moving there. In the European Union, again, carbon neutral by 2050, we're waiting for the first by 55 plan to come out uh, next month and uh, achieve many of the significant reductions associated with their target, but the money is flowing as, as well. We see 672 billion uh, of coronavirus recovery uh, tagged for associated climate change initiatives in the form of resilience and recovery. We see transition to a greener economy and all of the investments must be in line with the EU's green taxonomy, which is certainly being nationalized and internationalized through work being done by the International Standards Organization. And last but not least, uh, coming forward in November of this year, we've got COP26, where we anticipate very significant announcements in and around uh, net zero emissions and broader corporate activities and targets. Next slide. Marco spoke about very specifically the science and the increasing related emissions that are giving rise to a number of the urgency parameters that are driving action and action in sectors that we haven't seen significant action for. So the IPCC has a, a number of Nobel laureate scientists at this point, and there is uncontroverted evidence that uh, we are the cause of climate change, and we also have a responsibility for being part of the solution. Next slide. I'll see if that helps. Next slide. So if I can go back uh, one slide, I'll just make sure that I'm where I should be. That's great. So why do boards need to put climate on the board agenda? Well, the first element is risk. And Margot spoke about the two elements of the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, determination or breakdown of risk. There are of course, physical risks associated with you. One of the first to speak about the unprecedented increase in uh, recovery costs associated with physical risk from a severe and extreme weather events causing damage to assets and a number of losses across the financial and economic sectors. But transition risk is a trickier one. It's how we characterize all of move to a lower carbon economy, regulatory, financial, consumer, investor, all of these elements come to play in trying to navigate a changing climate and a world that is responding to a changing climate. So central river. They certainly would agree that climate change poses a uh, adverse systemic and interconnected risk that really amplifies other business risks and not necessarily, it's not necessarily conducive to diversification. Uh, certainly we're seeing convergence and the global consensus arise around climate risk. And certainly a number of the accounting standards are converging in around the task force for climate, climate related financial disclosures. Uh, that includes the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, IFRIS, and a number of the other international standards. Uh, they all find that 72 of 77 industry subsectors are materially affected. As a foreshadowing of something I'll talk about later, not all of them are adversely materially affected. So it's not just a despair conversation. There is some hope and future profit uh, ability out there. 
in Canada, our Bank of Canada and OSFI, the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, are really piloting climate change scenarios for financial institutions. Given the impact in Canada, the northern part of which is warming at a rate that is twice as fast as the global average, two times as fast as the global average. And certainly looking at what came out of our expert panel on sustainable finance, there are some upsides to this. Climate change can present an opportunity and risk management needs to become embedded in everyday business decisions and products. Next slide. So that's the risk of what we're talking about. Let's look at it may also increase the cost of capital as a function of those increased risks. Pension funds, institutional investors are not only seeing calls for divestment from fossil fuel assets, but also they are being required to commit to net zero by 2050. And in order to do so, they're asking companies for information. What, are, what is your emissions profile? What are your life cycle assessment as emissions associated with your product or service? Uh, even law firms are being asked for this data at this point, which is why we are committing to associated. The eight leading Canadian pension plan CEOs all have called on companies to measure and thoroughly disclose environmental and socially go social industry relevant factors by leveraging the work that's been done by the sustainability accounting. Everyone's familiar with the BlackRock uh, uh, leader, Larry Fink, asking boards to be climate competent and deliver credible plans for how their business models will transition. And certainly in the first half of 2020, ESG index funds outperformed their conventional index fund counterparts and 23, 23 in the first half of 2020, new sustainable funds were launched. Next slide. So we've got the risk, we've got the investment. Let's look to regulation. We were fortunate to be involved in the Supreme Court of Canada reference case and all of the lower court, uh, appellate court challenges. And in Saskatchewan, on, the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal for Ontario both found that human-caused climate change poses an existential threat. The Alberta Court of Appeal also found that the dangers of climate change are undoubted, as are the risks flowing from failure to meet the essential challenges. Although those two entities or three entities came to different and, and I'll read this because I find it on climate change but spoke to the use of carbon pricing to address climate change and, and a direct quote from the court uh, right, written by the chief justice said that there is broad consensus among international expert bodies that carbon pricing is a critical measure for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. The matter to our response to an existential threat to human life in Canada and around the world. So we're definitely seeing increased regulatory pressure and support for regulatory actions taken by a number of jurisdictions to address climate change. We also have the Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act that establishes five-year carbon budgets towards meeting Canada's target. We've had some trouble meeting our targets over the last many years and actually have, this is intended to provide for more rigor in how we might do that. And Canada's large employer related financial disclosure consistent with the TCFD. So we have risk, we have investment, we have regulation. And next slide, we'll move on to the disclosure itself. Certainly, 
burgeoning support of the related climate disclosure for legislation and a number of governments, including to TCFD requirements, uh, which are uh, suggested and strongly recommended by our own expert panel on sustainable finance. And now Canada has required them for um, federal related crown corporations above a certain size threshold. Uh, we understand and know well that both Prime Minister Trudeau and President Biden continue to talk in and around the UN negotiations, the COP26 negotiations, about further requirements for financial institutions. Uh, and certainly New Zealand is along the way with the UK and Australia in requiring uh, mandatory disclosure. Next slide. So boards themselves and, and having acted as a, a director uh, on the board of directors of a multi-billion dollar energy company, the concern is what is your specific individual legal duty? And, and we're slightly different than the US in this regard. In the US, director's duties is to the shareholder. In Canada, director's duties are owed to the corporation itself. And specifically, every director of a corporation in exercising their powers and discharging their duties has to exercise the care and diligence and skill that a reasonably prudent person would exercise in comparable circumstances. And when we talk about prudence, often attached is the concept of foreseeability. And Marco spoke really well to the terms that are used by the IPCC around the foreseeability of the risk and harms associated with climate change. And I think it's very difficult to argue at this point that the risk is not foreseeable. Uh, so in that regard, a reasonably prudent person would respond diligently. We don't yet have any cases directly on Canadian directors' duties in and around responding to climate change, but changes become more material. And not to exacerbate or increase the pressure on directors to be perfect in any way, but they have to be reasonable. And the test really is the business rule. The direct realm of reasonableness. And if they do have, however, if they take and are blind to current issues, and in fact, what some may argue, unlikely that the courts will defer to a director's business judgment. So, next slide. The securities regulators are adding additional security uh, and certainty to the issue. We started off with the Ontario Securities Commission facilitating the Canadian Securities Administrator's staff notice 51333 around environmental related disclosures. And more recently in 2019, we have staff, staff notice 51358, which makes the risk of climate change fairly clear and indicates the requirement for companies to disclose material climate risks and how they address them. One of the key things is that the guidance makes it clear that they're not limiting material materiality assessments to near term risks. So it's looking at a broader perspective and how they do that should include uh, expertise very specific to climate risks, and associated response. So we'll talk about this later about how a company could go about doing that, but certainly there's room for both internal and external competence and expertise. Um, the investors and those acting on disclosures should, be, should benefit from clear and relevant and understandable entity specific disclosure. If you are an energy company, that is engaged in the oil and gas sector, you don't necessarily want to be talking about the risks identified by, for example, a consumer packaged goods company. You want to look at the risks specific 
to your business, your investors, and the long-term viability of it. And where practical, practicable, companies should quantify and disclose the potential financial and other risks. This could include share value at risk. And I would note that Transalta does provide some disclosure in that regard. Last slide. Uh, second last slide. Just to note that uh, Carol Hansel, who is one of the leading governance experts, really has provided a clear opinion on uh, directors' duties in this regard, and they must, at a minimum, put climate change on the board agenda and ask relevant questions to ensure that the risk is being managed. They have to be satisfied that the corporation is addressing climate change risk appropriately. It's an excellent opinion. I'd strongly recommend it. Next slide. This is just an outline of how the TCFD looks at managing risk. Four key elements with 11 sub-elements, governance, strategy, risk management, metrics and targets, and many large corporations are in uh, active reevaluation and assessment of those metrics and targets. Next slide. And let's talk about the opportunities. If you look at the recent uh, Mercer report, it identifies sector, subsector, sector specifics, uh, potential for financial impact in 2030 and 2050 associated with climate change. Not all sectors are negatively harmed. In fact, the renewable energy sector and sustainable construction and infrastructure sector are seeing a boon, a great growth materially related to and associated with the need to adapt to and address climate. Global energy grids are transforming and we have a fantastic opportunity in Canada as we have a very clean electricity grid uh, and there's significant potential for distributed and decarbonized energy. And there are of new low emission context of developing new markets that have resulted from addressing climate change. Last slide. And that is it at this point. Thanks, Lisa. And thanks, Margo, for those insightful presentations. And uh, thank you, Alistair, for the introduction as well. As a, as a lawyer in private practice, I usually take uh, 10 minutes just to talk about myself and my firm. So I'm, I'm grateful that you covered that for me. Uh, but, but I will just add one detail that might be relevant here. So in addition to Saskatchewan, I also practice law in Alberta. And when we're not in the midst of a, a global pandemic, I usually spend some time in our Calgary office. Uh, you'll, you'll see in the, in the following seven or eight slides that I'm going to go through that, that there's important similarities and differences between Saskatchewan and Alberta that I'll touch on. We're gonna dive right into this and talk about these three trends. And so the first, the first trend, the first thing that's happening here in Saskatchewan, um, and this has been going on for some time, but it's, it's kind of reaching a, a point where, uh, where it's becoming quite relevant and that's, and that's emissions offsets. So Saskatchewan has been planning an emission emissions offset trading regime for many, many years, uh, going, going back actually more than a, more than a decade. And, um, we're at the point right now where Saskatchewan has actually uh, passed certain parts of the Management and Reduction of Greenhouse Gases Act. So emissions offsets, yeah. So Saskatchewan's introduced an emissions offset uh, trading scheme. And so what we'll, what we'll talk about here is just about how that emissions offset trading scheme works. And the, the, for folks from Alberta, you'll be quite familiar with the program that Saskatchewan's planning. The Saskatchewan Offset Trading Program is quite closely modeled on that of Alberta's. And so um, without getting into the, the details about the, the scheme, what, what I've outlined here are, are, are really the three choices, the three decision points that regulated emitters need to make. And these are similar decision points that regulated emitters in Alberta need to make. And I, I, I 
I believe this is this is what regulated emitters are considering right now. So you've got three options under the new Saskatchewan uh, emissions offset trading scheme. So you can either, as a regulated emitter, you can either implement clean technology to reduce um, emissions, or you can pay into a, a technology fund. It's called the Tier Fund in Alberta. We call we'd be calling it the Technology Fund here in Saskatchewan. Uh, you can pay into that uh, technology fund and then make applications to the technology fund to receive funding later for certain projects. You may or may not receive funding, but um, but nonetheless, there's the option to pay into that fund. Um, any of the projects that receive funding pursuant to the technology fund need to reduce emissions, right? And so this is a this is a model that's worked quite well in Alberta. Saskatchewan is is planning on on introducing that as well. Uh, that's just one of the options. So then the, and the third option, and this is the option that's I think getting the most coverage right now, uh, at least in Saskatchewan. It's it's for regulated emitters to purchase emissions offsets from third parties, right? So where are we at right now with this program? So the the, the Management and Reduction of Greenhouse Gases Act, it's being proclaimed already. Um, it's, it's received royal assent. The regulations have been introduced and the government of Saskatchewan are just working on the, um, the, the last important thing in the program, which is to confirm all of the protocols. Uh, the government of Saskatchewan looks set to introduce this program sometime this year, but we're expecting that sort of at the, at the latest uh, in 2022. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, so why don't we just dive into this just a little bit, a uh, little bit deeper. So how are Saskatchewan businesses preparing for the emissions offset program? Well, there's, th there's three different perspectives you can have on this. And then the first is the perspective of the regulated emitter. What, what are regulated emitters doing right now in Saskatchewan? So they're considering which of those three options they might prefer. And, and as part of that analysis of which, uh, of which of the three options makes the most sense for them as a regulated emitter, they're checking alignment with and, and, and in some cases developing new compliance policies to accommodate which of those three choices they, they, they want to focus on. Um, they're not mutually exclusive in any way. Um, the compliance regime is an annual regime. And so uh, there's the possibility for change, but because this is a new program, regulated emitters need to start somewhere. And so they're, 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 they're sort of thinking through the pros and cons of each of those three options. Um, you've got another group that's fairly active in Saskatchewan and in Alberta as well too, and those are project developers, right? And so the project developers are looking at the emissions offset program a little bit differently. And they're, uh, they've got their own projects that they want to develop, um, sometimes together with uh, regulated emitters, sometimes on their own. But they're now at the stage where they see uh, the creation of offsets as a new revenue stream for their particular project. And what they're doing is they're um, amending their business cases accordingly, and, and, and usually in an upward fashion, meaning that this new revenue stream it makes projects that in the past Weren't, weren't feasible, that were sort of just on the periphery of being feasible or not, that they are feasible now because that kind of, that they've crossed the threshold in, in making an economic uh, project. And so most, many project developers are, um, have a fairly high level of comfort that this program that the government of Saskatchewan is going to introduce, introduce is, is viable in the long term and that they're planning on creating and trading these offsets. And then the third important group here, um, to look at is the regulators, of course, and that, that's, that's uh, primarily the government of Saskatchewan. And they're right now, as I mentioned, confirming the protocols. For those from not familiar with the program, the protocols are really just the, the rule book to give you an I really to, to verify the offset to make sure it's legitimate. And it's usually done by third parties. But the protocols are really important because they tell you how you can create offsets. And so they're industry specific. And so the government of Saskatchewan has also has already said that uh, landfill gas protocol is likely to be introduced, an aerobic composting uh, protocol is likely to be introduced, and an enhanced oil recovery protocol is likely to be introduced. And they're just looking at what additional protocols will follow on that. Um, and then of course, the, the government of Saskatchewan is looking to resource and, and run this program, which will be rolled out in the, in the coming months. So, so 
you can see that this that this particular program has attracted a lot of attention from a lot of different groups in, in Saskatchewan and everyone is actually quite 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 excited about it I'd say. Um, moving on let's take the second broad trend here and let's unpack this a little bit so this this sort of broader category is distributed energy and there's many different projects that are happening or that are proposed in Saskatchewan right now uh, around the theme of distributed energy and these projects tie tie back to organizations policies really on climate risk because I mean, often the projects are driven by like an existing internal policy to lower greenhouse gas emissions, but sometimes the projects are driven like by just commercial reasons uh, that later leads to the development of new policies related to climate change. And so uh, as a projects lawyer, I'm sort of uh, approaching this from uh, with, with an on the ground perspective. And, and these are just some of the things that, I, that I'm seeing across Saskatchewan happening right now. And so uh, I'll just quickly go through these points and cover them. So we, we've got, uh, Saskatchewan, very large mining jurisdiction, and we've got a, a miners interested, of course, in meeting emissions reductions targets, and there's interest in purchasing renewable energy from independent power producers. Uh, we've got industrial project owners here in Saskatchewan, such as fertilizer and oil and gas producers, and they're, 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 you know, they're expressing some interest in behind the fence, as it's called, power generation that the industrial projects owners own and control. Uh, we've got a very large agricultural sector here in Saskatchewan, uh, lar large corporate farmers, and they're looking to produce their own clean and renewable electricity because they sort of see the electrification of agriculture um, happening in the future. And so they're trying to, uh, try to realign their agricultural uh, businesses and practices to, uh, to, to really be uh, electrified. Um, We've got small businesses in Saskatchewan also that are generating their own power. You know, this is like rooftop solar uh, or geothermal heating. I mean, if you're if you're if you're looking at this from the Ontario perspective, it'll seem a bit odd because I mean, Ontario has sort of been through this like 15 years ago. You know, so so we're a little bit behind here in Saskatchewan, but we're um, we're catching up quickly. Uh, we've also had a number of Indigenous groups in the province that are interested in you know being developers and owners of uh, utility scale power generation in, in their own right. And that applies to things like nuclear, uh, which is under, considera under consideration right now in the province and, and also renewable power generation. Uh, we also have municipal utilities that are interested in, in owning or contracting with independent power producers for renewable power. Um, and that's, that's also sort of being driven in the background by different emission reduction targets that cities have, have specified. And then finally, last but not least, we've got universities and other government bodies interested in generating their own clean and renewable power to meet their own GHG reduction targets. So, so there, there's a lot going on in Saskatchewan right now. And it all kind of, the, the, the overarching theme is sort of distributed energy. Um, and in the background, as I said, there's, there, there's different policies on climate risk depending on depending mostly on the particular organization i mean obviously there's significant differences between a you know a multinational miner and a, a small mechanical contractor in saskatchewan they've got very they've got quite a different perspective on it but the common theme is they're they're, they're both interested in distributed energy so yeah, uh, it's interesting to just look quickly at Alberta's regulatory framework. So Alberta has a uh, has a different framework from Saskatchewan. There's a lot of similarities with our laws between the two provinces, but the electricity regulation framework is it's not the same. And so Alberta has been uh, um, really uh, producing a number of corporate PPAs, a significant amount in the past few months, actually. These, these are corporations that are purchasing power from independent power producers. And so that's, that's, been, that's been sort of gathering a lot of uh, interest here in Saskatchewan. And so there's different groups in Saskatchewan that have been sort of pushing for more choice and control over power generation. And I just sort of my personal view on this is that that's largely coming from sort of seeing what's going on in Alberta, even though, again, Alberta has a very different regulatory framework than Saskatchewan. But nonetheless, this is a, a trend that we're seeing. Um, we, we even have a new association that's recently been created um, to sort of address some of this, some of this demand, and that's the Distributed Energy Association of Saskatchewan. And I've got their uh, link there to their website if you wanted to check it out. So moving on to the third broad theme here. So this is uh, this is being talked about a lot over the past uh, many years. And so we see the oil and gas transition uh, 
happening now. It is, it, it is happening now in Saskatchewan and also in Alberta as well. And so we see different ways that this transition is happening. And again, it's, it's, it's being driven by different policies, internal policies of different organizations, right? So for, again, I see it mostly as a function of size for, for, for smaller developers um, that they don't, that aren't publicly traded. There's not a lot of, you know, immediate disclosure requirements that they have to meet. And, and that's, you know, quite different for, uh, you know, a publicly traded oil and gas company who, who really is wrestling with some very difficult questions when it comes to disclosing what is or is not a material change. But it seems to me that that part of the part of the solution, if I can call it that, or part of the transition um, is, is really in, in doing things a little bit differently in the oil and gas industry. And so we see some pretty, pretty unique and, um, and, and I think viable and feasible projects in Saskatchewan happening. We have geothermal projects that uh, use existing oil and gas drilling and extraction technology. Uh, very interesting stuff. We also have flare gas projects with, which capture the associated gas or waste gas as it's called and from oil wells and, and eliminate the flaring. Those are those, the, 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 the flames on those stacks that you see. Uh, we also have a number of uh, hydrogen projects that are happening in the province right now. And the aim is to extract hydrogen again from existing uh, oil reservoirs. Uh, lithium also uh, interesting, uh, interesting development in, developments happening with lithium. Lithium, some of the lithium projects are using existing oil and gas reservoirs to produce lithium. And of course, lithi lithium is a rare earth element that's used to produce uh, batteries for uh, EVs, electric vehicles. Uh, helium also uh, really seeing a bit of a resurgence in Saskatchewan at the moment. And helium projects are using, again, existing oil and gas drilling technology to extract the helium. And helium is used in um, manufacturing clean technology equipment. Uh, finally, we, we, we have an existing um, carbon capture and storage uh, project here in Saskatchewan and C CCS is, 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 has been topical for, for, for many years in Saskatchewan and, and continues to be topical, particularly with um, the facility that exists at, at the moment. And so, so what we're seeing really is, is uh, an, industry, an industry in transition. And that transition, I think, is again being driven by different disclosure requirements for some of the larger companies and for some of the smaller smaller companies, it's it's really just internal internal policies that that they've set on their own because it's you know it's it's become clear where they want to go with their business. So it's it's all all, all very all very exciting stuff. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, many oil and gas producers active in Saskatchewan. Uh, not, not based in Saskatchewan, but active in Saskatchewan have voluntarily set emissions reduction targets that they're working on right now. And so that's why we're seeing different sorts of projects coming to the forefront and being developed. Um, my, my, my personal view is that oil and gas will continue to be in a, to continue to be extracted in Saskatchewan for the foreseeable future, but but likely with these reduced greenhouse gas emissions, right? And that's that's what's happening right now. We don't exactly know which projects are going to see the light of day. We don't really know how significantly greenhouse gas emissions will be reduced, but it's it's clear that there's an effort to make that happen right now. Uh, and last point here, I my personal view also, I anticipate that ongoing and increasing climate risk disclosures from oil and gas companies will continue, as I said, as, as these transition projects are realized and, and really processes and business practices are changed, right? And that's, that's really, all I, I, really all I've got. So these three trends of uh, use of emissions offsets, uh, distributed energy, and the oil and gas transition are, are all either driving further climate risk disclosure or they're moving organizations further forward in their thinking on their internal on their own climate change policies and so it's a it's a very 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 exciting time to be a projects lawyer in saskatchewan um, right now and with that i will pass things back to our moderator alistair thank you chad thank you margo and Lisa and Chad for your presentations and, and for sharing your, your expertise. Uh, what you've been able to do to frame the discussion is talk through some of the evidence and the implications and, and what some of the opportunities are right on the ground uh, in Saskatchewan. Now, we're going to move into the question and answer portion of today's event. And I've got some questions uh, prepared in order to get the conversation started, but I encourage members of the audience to submit your questions to me um, Alistair McFadden through the Zoom's chat function. 
Um, now, I, I, I want to start uh, the, the question period with a question for you, Lisa. And uh, it's just a foundational question, really. Uh, and, and it's about your take on the legal imperative of climate risk assessment and disclosure. We just heard Chad talk about a distinction um, between uh, larger organizations who have an obligation to disclose, but also smaller organizations who are taking a strategic uh, direction that, that supports adaptation. So I just wonder, Lisa, if you could offer uh, your views on the imperative. Yeah, I think that Carol Hansel's got it right. Whether you're large or small, your investors now want to know there is value at risk, but not to be lost on this crowd in particular is there are opportunities. And let me talk about some Saskatchewan specific opportunities. Pulses, your agriculture and precision agricultural sector are phenomenal. I was shocked in working in Saskatchewan to find out that you supply 98% of Canada's pulses, 46% of the world's pulses. And of course, if you look at that from a climate change baseline, there are many good arguments to be made that you are in fact contributing in terms of the development and farming of some of those pulses to a net life cycle assessment, lower food sector and more food security. So really great stories in relation to agriculture. In relation to your system, Saskatchewan's, I call it the Mr. GHG Act, uh, Management Reduction of Greenhouse Gas Act, is based on probably one of the few leading systems in the world now that actually includes adaptation as a metric. You have a resilience score that includes consideration of natural ecosystems, economic and financial ecosystems, communities and people in Indigenous ecosystems, Indigenous rights holders, as well as the associated impact on infrastructure. And from that perspective, if you score climate change on that basis, you can really see where there are opportunities to develop and very significant opportunities for Saskatchewan business, big or small. So as a short answer, Alistair, I think the imperatives there, big or small, but it's not all about risk. There are definitely, particularly in a jurisdiction that is as resource rich as Saskatchewan, lots of opportunity too. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that lens on things because uh, we did hear evidence of some business opportunities in places like Saskatchewan. And I wonder if I could turn maybe to Chad for an angle on this. So uh, we've got a, a question from the audience and it has to do with an acknowledgement that making these changes requires an investment, whether it's an opportunity or a risk, we're talking about a transition. And, and so the question from the audience, Chad, is has the Saskatchewan government done a cost analysis of the best ways to reduce carbon emissions? Uh, because uh, there, uh, there appears to be a preference for expensive technologies such as carbon capture, small modular nuclear reactors, um, and, and, and things like the net metering program. Um, Chad, what's your view on, on renewable energy technologies and how it all fits together in this province? Yeah, thanks, Alistair. So I, I don't know if the government of Saskatchewan has performed a cost analysis or not. So, and, and and that's not really sort of my, I wouldn't have the expertise to comment on that in any case, but I certainly do have the expertise to comment about renewable energy. And so I've been involved with uh, renewable energy development in Saskatchewan for many years, going back to uh, 2004, in fact, be, be, before the oil and gas boom in Saskatchewan even, and which was a long time ago. And I think I was the only person in the province that was interested in renewable energy at that point in time. But 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 since then, uh, I really, a, a lot has changed in Saskatchewan in regard to renewable energy. In particular, uh, Sask Power has, has said about, oh, about a decade or so ago, maybe 12, 13 years ago, that they were planning a bit of a pipeline when it comes to procuring renewable energy projects and that they were going to not only uh, put forward a pipeline, they were going to engage independent power producers to help um, really to help the, at that time to help develop more renewable energy. This is, there's been a lot of change since then, but um, SAS, SAS Power did that. In fact, they did that and they, they proceeded to uh, 
issue a number of different competitive procurement processes to uh, procure uh, wind power generation from IPPs, uh, solar generation from IPPs. Uh, more recently, the, the, the focus has been on engaging Indigenous groups in the procurement process, you know, incentivizing developers to engage Indigenous groups. And, and, and how that's happened is through, you know, evaluation criteria in RFPs and things like that. And so, if you, if you look back, if you have the opportunity to look back 10, 12, 13, 14 years, actually on the on the renewable side, that the, the, for me anyway, that the change has been, you know, it's quite breathtaking, actually. It's it's quite breath, breathtaking. It really is. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I remember I remember having you know sort of sort of very direct conversations with all different sorts of folks in in, in Saskatchewan that just thought renewables were just like a crazy a crazy idea like just like that's crazy like it's just crazy I really that's not that long ago and so when I think back to those conversations um, those attitudes have changed a lot and it's not just the attitudes to renewable energy it's that. Uh, wind projects are getting built right now. I mean, we're in the middle of an RFP process right now. There'll be a, an announcement for wind. Uh, solar projects are are getting built out. Geothermal projects are are getting built out. I mean, it's all it's all very it's all very real. It's all very real, and that that's a good thing. It's a very good thing. And there's and just picking up on Lisa's point. Um, there's lots of opportunities for farmers in that too. I mean, there's option to lease and lease agreements that independent power producers enter into for wind farms, and they can often be very very lucrative for, for farmers that have the good fortune of signing an option to lease and lease option to lease agreement with a with a good developer. And so there's a lot of these other spin-off developments that that you don't really talk about in renewables, but that are that are happening right now. And I I expect we'll see uh, at least the next decade we'll, we'll we'll probably see more just because we we've got targets in place that we've got to meet and um, the pipeline is there. And I I, I would be surprised if if we'd see a lot of a, a, a big departure from what's happened over the past decade. I'll stop now. I, I want to come back to to some of the examples and opportunities, but 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 before that, uh, a more foundational uh, question, Chad, and and then I want to turn back to Lisa on the same thing. What's been shared today is that the, the fact that there is uh, a sense of uncertainty uh, when it comes to climate risk, and even some of the business opportunities that are related. In, in your view, what might happen if if policies change direction, uh, like carbon policies uh, at a national level, um, or, or different technologies emerge? You know, do we really know enough to be confident about, about making investments and, and choices in a place like Saskatchewan? What are your views on that? Yeah, I can just comment real quick on this with, a, with maybe a, a practical example. So um, it, it comes from Ontario. And like I said before, Ontario is, uh, you know, decades ahead of Saskatchewan when it comes to the sort of the energy transition. Ontario stopped using coal long ago, largely because there, there, there's nuclear. But, but Ontario is a, a good example good jurisdiction to look at and to learn from if you're if you're in Saskatchewan or in Alberta. And so if you look at battery storage projects in, in Ontario right now, battery storage projects are, 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 are almost completely underpinned by regulation. Right. So battery storage projects where you where you peak shave or you undertake arbitrage, you, you, you basically where you basically um, mitigate lower the cost of your power bill by discharging energy from a battery this is all regulation right and so what i've seen myself is that when you're trying to, to put contracts in place and you've got significant regulation that underpins clean technology it can be very challenging to do those contracts right because because a, a change of law can mean the termination of a 20 year power purchase agreement right and so i've i mean i've i've i've, I've just frankly I've, on behalf of clients, I've struggled with that, right? And so it's been very hard. So I've seen a bit of an evolution in, in contracting as well too, which has been, been, been quite fascinating in Ontario that is, right? So we've had to spend you know, so much time working on these change of law clauses. And these are the kind of clauses that, you know, back in the day might be just standard boilerplate that you'd sort of put into the last third of your contract. And now, uh, and now like the risks that you're talking about, Alistair, like these, these the law changing, this can be a, a like a total deal breaker like it, it might be that the project won't even move forward if you can't figure out how the parties are going to deal with 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 a change of law because like in ontario for example like with the global adjustment charges if the provincial government was to say no more global adjustment charges oh gosh like that that means that there's there's complications in contracts and, and 
and at least I'll know more about this in Iowa, but there has been complications in energy contracts in Ontario over the years, not, not, just, not just battery storage projects, right? So it's, these are lessons learned for Saskatchewan. And I think that we, we, we can and should look to jurisdictions like Ontario for those, those lessons learned. Lisa, maybe I could turn to you then to, to comment on the same question. You know, in, in spite of all of the, the, the turbulence uh, that surrounds this, the, the science seems clear. And, and so in, in your experience and in your view, um, do we know enough to be confident about, about making uh, choices right now uh, as, as we advance in, in the corporate environment? I, I think we do, but let me follow up first on, on Chad's point and amplify it. Just the government folks on the call should realize that these massive pendulum swings in policy, cap and trade, cancel cap and trade before you're sworn in are economically efficient, inefficient. They really are not. So having some semblance of, albeit with on wide tracks, but forward moving policy in a consistent direction, I, I think we're getting there. It is a much more economically efficient way to proceed and your businesses will thank you. The worst thing that business hates is massive changes in policy and policy uncertainty so they can't operate and long-term plan and efficiently invest in longer-term assets. But in terms of the climate, no pun intended, that we find ourselves in now, I think the riskiest climate action is no climate action. So much like when you're investing for your retirement funds, you're counseled to develop a diversified portfolio of investments any prudent corporate should think of a diversified portfolio of responses. And certainly that's conducive. It's always pitched as an all or nothing response. We are all CCS or we are nothing. It's not actually the reality of how things work in corporate decision-making. There are many complementary actions that can be taken, many investments that can be made, and the use of the markets, particularly in relation to climate-related removals or net financially beneficial actions where you're actually just harnessing the waste in the corporation to become more efficient and increase your energy productivity. So there's, there's lots of opportunity to actually take those actions at a minimum, do the measurement, figure out where you're fat or where you're lean or where you could take more action and actually gain more customers by taking some reasonable response actions to climate change. And I think that's what the market is really calling for right now. Look at it, don't hide from it, lean in and figure out what works for you as a prudent corporation. Thanks, Lisa. So you, you've talked about what the market is looking for and the, the, the fact that uh, investors are, are seeking some certainty in terms of uh, regulation and, and, and policy to make Good choices. I want to turn the question back to, to Margo for a bit of a bigger picture then. Um, because climate change doesn't present the same opportunities and risks for every industry or, or every sector. You know, there's different issues for different sectors. How did decision makers address climate risk in, in that context? Hmm. Thanks for the question, Alistair. Um, and actually, that's a, a a fascinating question and I'm going to answer it with something I don't think you ex would expect to hear. I think Lisa and Chad have done a fantastic job of covering and, and pointing out sector specific um, laws, regulations, uh, things that are happening. And I actually think that the best decisions are made when we consider holistically the issue of climate change and we think about it. So whether we're acting for SAS power or an IPP, I think our best decisions are made when we actually consider the entire, um, the entire package of sectors. We think about the actual landscape of which we're operating both locally and nationally and globally. And only when we do that can we actually consider uh, risk holistically. Otherwise, we'll have blinders and we'll miss something. So for instance, we haven't talked about hydrogen yet. 
So there's an incredible opportunity with our oil and gas companies who know how to create hydrogen and use it in their processes to actually move agriculture. Chad was talking about electrifying agriculture. Well, we might actually be moving into hydrogen powered um, big machinery and semi-truck trailers. So I think it's really, really important not to get stuck in a sector or a very specific or a thinking of decisions in a, in a very small manner, but thinking of things and how they interconnect is really important. So some of it has to do with um, incapacity around, first of all, monitoring, verification, and reporting of greenhouse gas emissions um, that we need to do some more science and some more work on the ground about. So Lisa referred to our agricultural sector and our canola, which is fantastic, but we have never received any type of accounting that would credit our agricultural producers for their mintel practices, the fact that they actually use less GHGs. So I think it's it's really doing decisions holistically that needs to happen to make good decisions. Thanks, Alistair. Now, one of the things that you, you've said, uh, Margo, points to uh, uh, or is linked with a question from the, the audience, and it has to do with um, the, the political context around some of the questions on, on climate change. And I, I wonder if if, if our panelists, and, and Margo, I'll start with you, might have a view on, on what we might expect next in the political environment. We've just had a, an election in the, in the US where there's a significant commitment to reducing uh, emissions. We, we heard about some of that in, in today's presentations. Uh, other commitments are occurring uh, globally uh, that, that you shared. Where do you anticipate the next sets of, of regulations and, and commitments that, that might uh, arise? Yeah, thanks for that question too, because I kind of alluded to this in my presentation. We are changing our policy landscape internationally and here in Canada with these declarations of emission reductions prior to the conference of parties of the UNFCC that'll happen in December. So this is very different because historically the prime minister would go make a commitment and then come back and never legislate it in. So I'm actually incredibly optimistic with the Supreme Court of Canada decision that carbon pricing is here and we have some security that we will proceed with increasing the cost of carbon through various mechanisms. So the IPCC, no one policy is going to get us there. It's actually a suite of policy and carbon pricing is definitely the IPCC land and climate report is central. It's efficient. It works really, really well. So I'm actually optimistic that changes in law will be minimalistic going forward, even with a change in government. Our conservative leader is supporting carbon pricing. Uh, so I'm actually very optimistic that this isn't a risk. And I want to say another thing about risk. We're talking about risk as if it's a really bad thing. And another thing I'd alluded to is actually the more risk involved, the higher the rate of return. So when you negotiate power purchase agreements, the higher the risk that the IPP or the PPA offtake person is taking will determine their rate of return. And it will also feed into how that risk is shared in the PPA based on what the entity that's doing the contract can control. So if something's within their control, they will be subject to taking that liability. So that's a, that's a key point that Chad covered really, really well, but it does have its upsides as well with rates of return. Thanks for that. I appreciate that that answer. I, I do think it helps to uh, highlight that we're we're trying to consider risks and opportunities, and and embedded with that is is the risk of missed opportunities. Um, now I, I want to come back to uh, Lisa for a moment. We we've talked about changing national and and global commitments related to climate. We've talked a bit about changes in government and and changes in law. But really, the, 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 what's central to this discussion is changes in action and, and what it actually means in the ground, on the ground for uh, businesses and industry in Canada and places like Saskatchewan. Now, now Lisa, um, what do you think are the main challenges uh, to better 
climate uh, risk assessment and disclosure today. Um, let's convert this into something that's that's real for our audience. How should directors and, and management and leaders get started? Yeah, the simple starting point for a board in assessing strategic risk and strategic response is what's the status quo? What are our emissions? First of all, what are our scope one, our direct emissions? What are our emissions from energy usage, our scope two emissions? And what are our scope three emissions? The emissions associated with the use of our product or service and or our supply chain. What can we control? What can't we control? And what does the future look like? Where are things going? Can we foresee reasonably based on International Energy Agency reporting, uh, based on scenario planning done by people in our sector, people outside of our sector, based on protests that we're facing and or shareholder uh, related actions at our general, our AGMs? Uh, and resolutions that are coming forward, what can we foresee as being the very likely near-term future, medium-term future, and, and longer-term, less than certain future, but likely pathway? And, and that first measurement piece is, is fairly important. And there are a host of internal GHG quantification resources, external experts, and external database bases to see how you're doing. And one of the things that the companies that I has sit or have sat on the board of directors on is to measure yourself against your, your peers. How am I doing relative to my comparators and cohorts? And you can be darn sure that if they find themselves at the bottom of the curve in the highest emission, they're gonna be taking action very quickly. And we're seeing this happen in the construction sector, for example, right now. North America is generally far behind their European construction counterparts. And a few of them, I'd note that Acon would be one of them, had the aha moment and really, really launched a number of initiatives to look at their own direct emissions, scope two emissions, and broader ways that they can influence scope three emissions. Uh, Skanska in Sweden is one of the leading ones. So here are elements where we're all working together and emphasizing and the point that I made earlier and that Mar Margot made that we're talking about a portfolio of responses, not a single line item on a budget sheet, but rather changing our lens and the way we look at climate risk and opportunity in our decision-making at the very highest level. And that, that goes to the governance piece of TCFD. Strategic decision-making viewed with a, a climate lens is really useful. and and. In particular, once you get uh, discretionary pay of senior executives tied to climate outcomes, it's amazing what differential changes you get within a, an organization. So lots of ways to look at this. So you talk about discretionary pay as, as a way to dr drive attention to these kinds of things. Are there other barriers that that that, uh, that you you believe are, are preventing people from taking some of these intuitive steps? It sounds like what you're saying is we just need to get started in taking this yeah. portfolio approach, but what's you getting know, in the way? The small companies will say most certainly and, and validly that it's a question of resources. There are 20 of us and we're all overworked trying to respond to COVID and do this and this and this. How do we do all this at the same time? Sometimes it's short-term pain with long-term pain. You can actually decrease the amount of resources you need to get dedicated to some things by automating a number of these functions. And there are a number of folks who do this. I would you know, highlight any number of the good um, environmental and social governance consultants who really have software and data and do data scraping and use artificial intelligence and machine learning to really automate this at not a huge price. Um, and, and can actually do, uh, I think Climate Smart Business does a, an associated uh, tool that teaches you how to do the work yourself. And, and there are share benefits associated with that work being done, measurable share benefits. Well, and as we said in the introduction, we've also got CCLI that, that provides uh, advice to organizations as well at, at, at no cost. So I, I think it's Legal. helpful to, to yeah, Not exactly. To <laughs> Accounting too, but yeah, yeah. 
If I could turn uh, back to, to Chad then, because we are, we are um, trying to make things real for Saskatchewan organizations. Um, what kinds of questions uh, should boards be asking of management when it comes to understanding the exposure uh, to climate risk and, and some of the strategic opportunities? So Chad, I'll start with you and then maybe open it up to other panelists. Sure, I'll be mindful of time here. So what, what kind of question? So I mean, it's a typical lawyer answer here. So like it, it I mean, it, it varies, of course, right? So I mean, if you're a public, if you're, as Lisa pointed out, I mean, if you're publicly traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange, you actually have some certainty and some rules related to climate change disclosure that you that you actually really need to follow. So, so the questions for management are, are really to comply with these rules. And, you know, this is another typical lawyer thing to say, but you should really have a lawyer assist in ensuring compliance with security laws, right? And so, so, so that started sort of starting from the top, and that's talking about a publicly traded company, which I mean, we 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 don't have a lot of them in Saskatchewan, right? So most of the businesses here are small and medium-sized private enterprises, and again, it varies for, for, for from my perspective, like mostly by industry, right? So, you know, if you talk about farms, we have you know twenty-five thousand very sophisticated, very large, and growing agricultural operations farms um, here in Saskatchewan, and 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 they. Like with the farms, they're they're not set up in the same way as maybe uh, organizations in other provinces, right? So, the the board is typically the management, right? And farmers, you know, rely on external contracted uh, professional advisors, like a, like mostly accounting firms, and they might have like a a lawyer that helps out their their business, but. But uh, I mean, the questions there are really quite different, right? So if you, you know, if you look at a you look at a farm or farmer here in Saskatchewan, even though there's revenues are very strong, these are you know multi multi million dollar operations, right? Even more than that, the tens of millions, right? But it, it's a it's a very different sort of um, perspective, and 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 it's a very different perspective on what question to ask, right? So my 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 personal experience with with you know, looking at farmers in Saskatchewan is, is not really to, 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 to ask a question, but to, to pick a project, right? Pick something that you want to start developing. Start that conversation around your farm about a real potential project, right? Like solar panels, for example. Like, can, you, can we use the net metering program to generate solar power to reduce our bills? And then just picking a project sparks those discussions. And, and maybe that farm will end up, you know, trying to figure out sort of broader overall principles to drive their organization forward. I'll leave it at that. Margo, you touched on a, a bit of this as well, because you, you talked about the different types of, uh, of physical and, and, and regulatory uh, risks, um, or, or at least you had that in your presentation as well. I just wondered if you, there was more that you wanted to add, either of you. Uh, into the, the types of questions or, or approaches that, that leaders uh, should take um, in converting the thought into action and, and strategy in, in Saskatchewan businesses. I can go. Um, I, I, I love what my fellow panelists have said, so I don't want to repeat it. But one thing that I'm incredibly engaged with in my academic career is working with companies and people to imagine what net zero 2050 looks like and backcast it so that we don't make those stranded infrastructure mistakes. And I don't have all the answers as an academic, but when I work with companies, businesses, peoples in the community, it's incredible how smart they are at joining the dots together for me. We will in 2050 need hospitals, medical care, electric vehicles, and these require oil and gas. We will need hydrogen and this requires nuclear energy. We can all have solar and wind turbines. And if we do that, what will we need that will give us that reliable electricity when it's minus 40 and the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining? So I think by imagining that 2050 net zero and what what it could be, and I don't have all the answers. Maybe it's importing more hydro from Manitoba, but I think having the discussion and then for businesses to see their place in that net zero by 2050. If I'm an oil gas, I, maybe I need more CCS. I need to develop out my hydrogen. But these are the important discussions. And I really appreciate Lisa and Chad in advancing this discussion. Incremental steps are important. But big imaginations, I think, are just as important in our strategies. 
And, and as Lisa points out, we're talking about a portfolio of responses and, and, and scenario planning uh, to help uh, with, with some of that strategic thinking. Now, Lisa, I wanted to turn to you briefly to see if there was anything further that you wanted to add. Just briefly, I think Margo and Chad covered it beautifully. The one element where boards have the most, boards that we assist have the most trouble with is transition risk. It's really tricky to try and imagine and get out five or six years with the potential run on ramifications of climate change. So this is the impact on your emissions. What about the impact on water availability? What about your logistics pathways? What if this waterway does not have sufficient water in it to traverse and you rely upon that to get your product to market? What about if your labor force can not work if the temperature, ambient temperature is over 45 degrees? This is a very real problem in many extractives and other industries that rely on outdoor labor forces. Um, there, there's a host of transition risks that really start thinking about your customers, your suppliers, and the people who work for your organization. How will they be, what if they can't get to work? You know, these are all the implications that we're certainly seeing a mini rehearsal for right now in the context of COVID. And I say mini because the projected impacts are significantly larger than what, than what we've just encountered. Thank you for making that point, because a lot of the discussion that, that we've had uh, here and, and, and publicly is about emissions and, and not the risks that are associated with a changing climate. Uh, uh, things like severe weather and, and, and flood and, and implications for business operations. So I'm glad that you brought that home. In terms well, that's of the what scenario I love planning. Your, Alistair, your metric is so good. You actually look at that. You look at the impact on people, on financial systems and on adaptation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, toot the horn a little bit, Saskatchewan. You, you've done something that's very good and very wise. That the resilience uh, strategy is what it's all about. Now, I, I do want to thank today's speakers, Dr. Margot Hurlbert, Lisa DeMarco, Chad Eggerman for your insight into climate risk disclosure. I'd also like to thank today's lecture partners, the uh, Canada Climate Law Initiative, CCLI, and the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce. And finally, I'd like to thank all of the audience members for uh, um, offering their great questions uh, to our panel and for joining us here today. Please join me in a, in a round of virtual applause for our speakers using Zoom's reaction option. And, and thank you all and, and have a wonderful afternoon.